A lesson from the Song of Songs, the first chapter beginning at the eighth verse. If you do not know yourself, O fairest among women, go forth and follow the tracks of the flocks and pasture your kids by the shepherd's tents. I have compared you, my friend, to my company of horsemen among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are beautiful as turtle doves, your neck as jewels. We will make you necklaces of gold inlaid with silver. Here endeth the lesson. A lesson from a treatise by the Venerable St. Bede. The same bridegroom, that is, Christ, the eternal word of God, continues by saying, and pasture your kids besides the, the, beside the shepherd's tents. That is to say, feed the lost disciples who have abandoned the words that are given by the one shepherd through the counsel of prudent teachers and followed after the doctrines instead of foolish teachers. For surely I have commanded you that if you love me, you will indeed pasture, even feed my sheep that is, the souls who serve me in simplicity and innocence, with the word of salvation. And it is my will that you should attend to this duty with so much care that you would prefer to suffer every misfortune and even to undergo the anguish of death rather than to leave off feeding them. How can you not know that you have been betrothed to me under the condition that you are to pasture your kids, to feed them, that is, those who have associated with erring teachers, rather than to wait on the wanton and proud, who are rightly called both kids and your kids, namely those who are to be positioned on the left hand at the judgment. But they are yours, since they have not been instructed according to the rule of my commandments, but rather according to your errors, that is, the ones in which you were held fast before you were united with me. Now the Lord here is not saying these things by way of, way of commanding, but rather by way of threatening and insinuating what would happen to those who separate themselves from the unity of peace, because they cannot bear the misfortune of trials, as in the gospel when our Lord says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. He is not commanding us to do evil, but he is teaching what reward awaits those who do evil. Here endeth the lesson. We continue to reflect on these words from the bridegroom. If you do not know yourself, O fairest among women, go forth and follow the tracks of the flocks and pasture your kids by the shepherd's tents. And this is, in the Song of Songs, read through the Christian faith by means of the Holy Spirit, and here, particularly through the insight of St. Bede, we're hearing this as a loving rebuke of, of sorts by Jesus to the bride, to the church, remembering if you do not know yourself as if you don't, if you've forgotten that you're members of me through baptism, you who are the fairest of women made fair, fairer than any by baptism. 
baptism, the regenerating waters of baptism. If you don't remember this, then go forth and follow the tracks of the flocks. I can't make you, in other words, follow me if you've forgotten who you are. If I, I can't make you search for the teachers of the gospel who, who make me present if you don't want to. Go forth, follow the tracks of the flocks, and pasture your kids by the shepherd's tent. Why does he say, and pasture your kids by the shepherd's tent, which is what we're focusing on today? The kids refer to lost disciples, disciples of the church who had gone away, had followed teachers other than orthodox sound preachers, and go and love them. And so, so this is a very interesting teaching from Jesus, interpreted in the way that Bede is doing so. If you don't remember who you are, then go and love the, the disciples who have not followed me. You would think he wouldn't say that. You would think something like, if you don't remember who you are, if you don't know yourself, then let me teach you again who you are, and gosh darn it, choose me. <laughs> but he doesn't say that. Go follow the tracks of the flocks and pasture your kids or feed, the, feed my sheep, as, as Jesus said to Peter three times. Go feed my sheep. So feeding the sheep, going and finding the people who are lost, it seems, according to the logic here, will help to remind us who we are. Our faith will, will, uh, will be restored, will remember that we are members of Christ's body, that we are betrothed as the church to the bridegroom. We will remember this and our faith will increase as we love those who need Jesus. And all of a sudden, that is a teaching that sounds very familiar. We are to do that. We are to take care of our brothers and sisters if their faith is diminished. And we're to go and love them and feed them, which is what it means to love. And we have brothers and sisters in the church who are constantly losing their faith. It's I've said in the past, it's sort of, it's a bit like the waters. I mean, it's like an ebb and a flow. We'd like, of course, our faith always to be the highest it can be. But, but things happen in life. People treat us terribly. Life takes us to terrible turns sometimes for us personally, for people we know. Bad things happen to good people who don't deserve it all the time. People suffer. Why are they suffering? It's easy for a faith to, to be diminished in situations like this. Very easy. And, in, and while we would never prefer it that way, in a way, it, it's, I don't want to say it's normal, but it's very common. So if we are feeling that our, our faith is, is uh, needing some pick me up. If we're feeling our, our faith has, has gone down and we, 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 we yearn for Christ's presence, because it's Christ's presence that increases our faith. The, the bridegroom, Jesus, the eternal word of God is saying, go 
and love those people who, whose faith has gone awry. Love them. Love them. does not exactly say go and preach the gospel to them. But we preach the gospel when we love people in the name of Jesus. Preach the gospel with words, yes, but also with deeds. And sometimes it's deeds that speak louder than words. Especially those whose faith is unsure. Bede goes on to talk about our Lord insinuating, and and almost, well, he does use the word threatening, what would happen to those who separate themselves from the unity of the peace of the church, who separate themselves from the church, because they cannot bear the misfortune of trials. He says, He is not commanding us to do evil, meaning make the tree bad and the fruit bad, but he is teaching what will happen to to those who do evil. It's a bit of a, I'm not entirely sure, it doesn't seem quite to fit with what we're talking about here, but I will just comment and say, we don't know what happens to those who do evil and choose evil in any specific sense. In, in the New Testament, Jesus, in many places, talks about the eternal fires of hell. And that's, an, therefore, an ancient doctrine in the church, but it's a bit like death. We know that uh, those who are faithful continue in life. We have that sort of teaching from the New Testament, from Jesus. We don't know what the afterlife, to put it that way, looks like, feels like, you know, we, God, we trust, has not revealed this to us because we don't need to know all we should think about is just being faithful and the rest will take care of itself. In the same way, we don't really know that much about that, about hell. Eternal fire is probably enough for most people to want to avoid it. One of the things that, um, so you get a lot of theology or people doing theological thinking on what hell involves and what how it works and things like that. And again, I, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't care to know firsthand either, um, to put it mildly. But one of the ways that hell is spoken of, which I offer up for your prayer, not as doctrine, but as some pious thinking, is that there's a voice in the Anglican tradition named John Henry Newman who, who, talk, who talked about this, and I'm kind of paraphrasing. Heaven and hell, are, are if we speak of a place, they're in the same place. It's, it's heaven when we're turned towards God. And it's heaven when having done works of mercy and having attempted as best we can to be humble, then we're able to behold God. On the other side, it's hell, same place, for those who were, instead of being humble, were proud, instead of doing works of mercy, did works of, for selfish gain, works for show. And they, because their heart is hardened, cannot behold the face of God and not being able to look upon the face of God is hell. 
not being able to handle the truth, to paraphrase a movie which some of you might have seen, can't handle the truth. I, you know, whether hell and heaven is like that, I don't know. It's a bit like that here, though, having lived through a period of time when I was not following the, ch uh, the church and not participating in the church, and um, I would say that while that period of my life was certainly full of joy and, and moments of peace and glory, and which, looking back, I attribute to God, who was acting anonymously in my life, in many ways, I was having much trouble and struggles, and there was a, a hell-like component or feeling at times. I was lost. And so, anyway, we certainly do not want to be lost. We certainly do not want to be unable to behold the face of God, the face of Christ in heaven. We, we, we want to enjoy eternal salvation. And the way that that happens, which is taught by Jesus and is taught in the New Testament and is even taught in Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament, is to yearn for Jesus. And when we know about Jesus, knowledge brings love of him. And love brings knowledge. And then knowledge brings love. And it's a holy cycle of deepening relationship, love and knowledge working together. And so we must seek to learn about Jesus as student, which is what disciple means. And we must, as we learn about him, open our hearts and love him. If we do those things, we are acting like the bride. We are acting like Christians who are betrothed to Jesus. This is, in the Song of Songs, a love story. And the same thing in the Christian life. We're part of a love story. And in this story, let us try to never miss a moment to thank God for what he has given us and to love him for what he has given us and what he will give to those who are humble and contrite and who follow his son Jesus Christ who died for us that we may enjoy this love that we may enjoy freedom and salvation and perfection. Amen.